Hello everybody and welcome to my last Kaladesh complete set review. I am Evan Irwin and we're going to talk about every single card in Kaladesh, but this time around we're going to talk about all of the multicolor, all of the artifact, and all of the land cards in Kaladesh. So we begin with Cloudblazer. Now Cloudblazer is a blue, a white, and three generic mana for an uncommon 2-2 human scout that flies. And when it enters the battlefield you gain two life and you draw two cards. This card's amazing. This card is the closest we've seen in quite a while to a Muldrifter type card. It is a 5 mana 2-2 two, two flyer that draws you two cards. Yeah, it draws, it gains you two life, but whatever. It is Muldrifter as close as we've seen it. Muldrifter is amazing. This card is fantastic with so many incredible tricks in white or blue to blink things. This is the target that you want all the time. This is an absolute premium uncommon. It will put you into a white blue archetype all by itself. All by itself. Easy first pick. Always playing sealed if you're in these colors. It's not even close. The card is fantastic. It, will it get to standard? I don't know. I actually think it's not necessarily a 100% no here. I just think it's probably not likely. Um, Contraband Kingpin is next. It is a black and a blue for a 1-4 uncommon Etherborn Rogue. It has life link, and whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, you may scry one. Okay. The artwork is sweet. The artwork is sweet. No, it's fine. I mean, this is one of those cards that, in a black blue type control shell, because that's what oftentimes you're when you're when you're playing black blue, you often have a lot of removal. You have counter spells. You have bounce. You have tricks. You have ways to make the game last longer because you have inevitability with cards like this. A one four life linker is going to block for a very long time with upside. It's going to attack, ideally not being able to get killed with upside. It's going to let you scry one as you play artifacts, which is an artifact block, and you're going to play a bunch of those throughout the game, getting a whole bunch of really small value out of this card, but over a very long term. So it's not necessarily amazing, but in the archetype that it wants to be in, it is exactly what you're looking for, and that's what that's what I like about it. If you're in black blue, this is the card for you. If you're drafting, it's a lot better, I think, because again, you're able to draft that black blue kind of control build, whereas in sealed, you know, things are kind of wild and crazy, but if you're playing sealed and you're playing black and blue, you're probably also in that type of control archetype, and this is exactly the type of two drop that you want to hold the ground and gain your life and be sitting there getting you value for the rest of the game. And they were, it's going to be tough to deal with it. And it's great also because no one really wants to use a removal spell on a card like this. This isn't like a huge threat, but it is a long-term advantage, and that's why it's powerful. Speaking of powerful, next up is Depala, Pilot Exemplar, a white, red, and a generic mana for a 3-3 rare legendary dwarf pilot. Other dwarves you control get plus one, plus one. Each vehicle you control gets plus one, plus one as long as it's a creature. And when it becomes tapped, you may pay X generic mana. If you do, reveal the top X cards of your library, you put all dwarf and vehicle cards from among them into your hand, and you put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Jeez. <laughs> it's been a while since I've seen something kind of overtly, incredibly powerful. Um, it is, it is kind of impressive, honestly, that there's just so much on top of this card. There's so many times I think Wizards has been like, okay, we'll make it a 3-3 for 3, and we'll give it this ability, and we'll give it that ability, and all right, we're done, let's go to lunch. Like, And then somebody was like, what if we could just, you know, like, you know, just kind of look for vehicles and dwarves because who cares? And so that second, that or I'm sorry, the third ability, beyond being a dwarf lord, beyond dwarves coming back to magic, which is awesome, and thirdly, you know, letting, letting uh, or secondly rather, letting vehicles be, be even more awesome because, you know, why not? Let's go find them all. Let's go find all the dwarves. Like, this card is super, super sweet. It is powerful enough that it doesn't really matter if it's not really pumping any other dwarves. Like, I would expect it to, but even if it doesn't, it's fine. The fact that when it crews a vehicle, you get an unbelievable advantage. That's crazy. Whenever it attacks, you get to do that. It's just whenever it becomes tapped, it doesn't matter. But the idea is that you're crewing, you know, you're using Topala to crew the vehicles, you're paying all the mana to find more vehicles and dwarves, and you just kind of keep the engine rolling. Like, this is a, this is not quite a bomb rare because it needs some of the right pieces, but it is an unbelievably close. It doesn't take that many pieces of, uh, or that many vehicles, or that many dwarves, or or really that many red and white cards because she is always playable for any of those colors and if you get those sweet bonuses high five but regardless you know this card is great now clearly in draft when you're able to really focus on the dwarves focus on getting vehicles early and often she becomes unbelievably sweet and i do expect her to see constructive play because that third ability is just it's just pushed it's like you know what would make it constructive playable this random thing that draws you a whole bunch of cards maybe you know like okay well what what if they just like my my expectation when i saw that ability when i read it for the first time i was like oh okay you're going to pay x and all the ones you find you get to pick one 
or all the ones you find, you get to put them on top of your library or something. And it's like, no, no, let's just put them in your hand. That's, that's crazy. This card is super good. Dovin Bond, speaking of super good cards, it is a white, blue, and two generic mana for a mythic planeswalker with three starting loyalty. It's plus one is until next turn. Until your next turn, up to one target creature gets minus three, minus O, and its activated abilities can't be activated. Minus one, you gain two life and you draw a card. Or minus seven, you get an emblem with whenever, with, I'm sorry, with, quote, your opponents can't untap more than two permanents during their untap steps. Now, that, that ultimate's weird. It's Static Orb. So if you look at the masterpieces, Static Orb is one of them. And when it first came out and you go back and watch my video, I'm just like, why is Static Orb here? This is why Static Orb is here. Dovin Bond's invention is the Static Orb. I think that's kind of cool. It's not super powerful as an ultimate, but that's not the power of this card anyway. The power of Dovin Bond is that it draws you three cards and gains you six life basically at worst usually at best that first thing it's doing when it comes down is it's going to plus one and deal with a threat deal with a problem uh it is just like any other planeswalker in limited it's amazing if you play it in in draft in sealed if you're anywhere near white and blue it is 100 percent amazing we'll do all the right things for you we'll shut down their best creature we'll keep drawing you cards and gaining you life like there's there's no it's really hard to say there's such a bad thing as a bad planeswalker in limited but, you know they still made tabalt so hmm Okay, but regardless, Dovin Bond, the real question is, will it get to Constructed? Maybe. It kind of, it does what a blue-white control deck wants to do. A blue-white control deck wants to hang out, draw cards, gain life, stop your guys, just kind of chill out, and eventually get an emblem or get an ultimate that kind of messes with you, but you never really want to cash Dovin Bond in for that. you rather get to eight loyalty and then cash it in for seven and then keep him around so he can keep messing with stuff and drawing you cards and so on and so forth. So Dovin is amazing and limited. There's no question. It's really if it's going to get to Constructed, and I think it's actually pretty close. I know it doesn't read that exciting, but Planes walkers are incredibly powerful they really only need just sort of slight incre incremental advantages and it's actually sort of the thing that uh, if i saw as, as i've spoken to r d over the years they've been kind of you know gun shy because like the problem is if you get two if you put an ability on a planeswalker that reads like oh my god it's unbelievable and it turns out to be not, not only that good but that much better you have to deal with whatever that ability is over and over again because that's how planeswalkers work their abilities just keep firing over and over so that's why when the super friends deck came out forever ago these days it was really concerning to wizards that all of these little small incremental things that you could do with these new planeswalker cards were going to be too much we're going to be too overwhelming and these days i think you have super friends decks and they're neat and they're cool but they're not unstoppable and so even if you have those incremental things happening even if we have those incremental advantages uh they're not they're not too much uh what i'm basically saying is i think dovamon has potential all I got. All right. Imper Imperial Voyager is a blue, green, and a generic mana for a 2 3 uncommon and Voldalkan Scout. It has flying and trample, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you get that many energy counters. So this card's amazing. Um, this card is super good. It's like it's awesome because they're they're clearly giving you different mana costs in terms of the different types of ten mana you know sort of options and ten mana uh, combinations that you could have, and this one is flying and trample. I like how it's trample on a two three. Right, it's always hilarious. But either way, it lets your pump spells be great. It lets you really just take the energy deck into the next into the next step. You know, a notch above what it currently was. You know, green I think can really take advantage of energy counters in ways that blue really couldn't but blue has some tricksy ways of doing things but this is a guy that kind of drives you into that type of archetype and if you can draft it early or if you can get it late because you're like the only green blue drafter that's what happens is that you're in the color combination nobody else is and you get to really take advantage of a card like this which is not inherently overpowered or overwhelming that someone's really going to hate draft it per se but man when you get it it's going to go right in your deck and do exactly what you want it to do um so it if you can play it in sealed, absolutely. If it's in your draft deck, that means you're in green blue, which means it is exactly what you want. I don't see it in constructed because it's just not powerful enough for the mana cost and what it does. But you know, like uh, in the in the format it is made to shine in, it shines very bright. Engineered Might is next, a white, green, and three generic mana, and you choose one of these uncommon sorcery options. Target creature gets plus five, plus five, and gains trample until end of turn. Or creatures you control get plus two, plus two, and gain vigilance until end of turn. So 
it's not overrun. We saw an overrun like creature earlier in green. This engineer might is also not overrun because they can't give you overrun. Overrun is stupid. Overrun is overpowered and overrun is like ridiculous. But engineered might is still fantastic and you're still going to play it in your green white decks and is still pickable early and it is still always playable and sealed. It's not going to get in constructed because it's just too much mana for, for what it is and what it does, but that's okay. This is another limited all-star, and I think you're going to see these kind of over and over again. They, Wizards really kind of seeds these things to let you pick a color combination and get awesome cards in that color combination to reward you for that type of behavior. Hazardous Conditions is next, speaking of. Black, green, two generic mana for a uncommon sorcery. Creatures with no counters on them get minus two, minus two until end of turn. And so as we saw... There were lots of creatures that put plus one, plus one counters on themselves, whether it's Fabricate, whether the spells that they give them, and this is both in black and in green. There was a black creature um, who, when it died, it put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature. Like, this is a, the exact type of card that it rewards that type of archetype. So, when you're in green, black, and it's all about counters all the time, this is perfect, and this card is going to be incredibly powerful and just swing games for you by itself. Camball Console of Allocation is a black, white, and a generic mana for a 2-3 rare legendary human advisor. Whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, that player loses 2 life and you gain 2 life. This card's pretty amazing, honestly. This card, if you are in black and white, it is 1,000% playable all of the time. Your, your opponent has to answer this, or they can't play non-creature spells without suffering. And it's not just suffering, it's like literally taking 10% of their life total and adding 10% back to yours, taking two, losing two, that's a four-point life swing. That's not messing around. Even if the next thing that happens is they play their removal spell to kill him, he's still drained for four. I mean... Again, four-point life swing. You gain two, they lose two. You know, those, those are the scales are, are changing, man. This, thing's, this thing is very, very good. Can it be in Constructed? Maybe. I really would not be surprised if this was a death and taxes answer to Ad Nauseam, you know, slash Storm Decks. I mean, sure, it's three mana. I get it. It's Legacy. But not everything has to happen by, you know, with two mana in Legacy. People do get to three. Knight of the Reliquary was a card that was played and continues to see play. But, you know, all I'm saying is this as an option in a deck is very powerful. I don't really see it in standard. It really needs the type of metagame and environment where there's a storm deck that's playing a whole bunch of non-creature spells or, uh, or an, yeah, so a whole bunch of non-creature spells that you can really kind of take advantage and make them suffer for it. And Camball, Comball, somebody will tell me how to say this correctly uh, in the comments. Uh, Comball is amazing. Uh, Rashmi Eternity's Crafter is a blue, green, and two generic mana for a 2 3 mythic legendary elf druid. When you cast your first spell each turn, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a non land card where the converted mana costs less than the, the spell's cost that you just played, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. And if you don't cast the revealed card, you put it into your hand. Card is bananas. Card is really, really super duper good with super duper good sauce kind of drizzled on top, uh, which is great because all the all the multicolor cards are pretty sweet. Uh, and Rashmi is absolutely awesome. Rashmi is a card that makes you want to play blue green. She draws you a card no matter what, no matter what. The first thing that you play every turn is either going to get you a free spell or going to get you a free card, and that's awesome. That is a machine that has to be stopped. This is a creature that must be answered. And ideally, in blue and green, you have the pump spells to stop. For direct damage you have the counter spells to stop for like actually things that just say destroy her she is incredibly powerful and the best part is that there's the sweet conspiracy theory that Rashmi is just an anagram of Mishra which it is an anagram but it's an anagram because it's Mishra yeah you know but we'll see now of course the 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 rumblings is that Phyrexians are going to show up because Phyrexians are half sort of machine and metal and Kaladesh is made of this Aether stuff, which is coming, you know, which they're using to, you know, scape, uh, sculpt and shape, just like the Phyrexians would sculpt and shape things into sort of humanoid forms and, and animal forms and whatnot. Uh, and so uh, the story, for those who aren't aware, that Mishra and Urza were brothers. They got in a big battle. Mishra was supposed to be dead, but Mishra, the, the, what happened to Mishra was that he went to Phyrexia, he got turned into a Phyrexian, basically, and then he came back. Uh, you can see the card Exoskeleton to sort of see what he looks like. Um, but regardless, uh, you know, this is the idea that if he... If he died and like he actually was you know revived by the Phyrexians or he still lived or still part of him was in Phyrexia and he kind of came back as this Rashmi character, I think that's totally sweet. It's a little tinfoil hatty for me. 
It's still sweet, it's just a little unlikely. Come on now. But the card itself is totally amazing. Will it get to constructed? Probably not. It's a tough mana cost. It's a low power and toughness for those mana costs. But like as a casual card, I think it's amazing. As a, as a limited card, it is absolutely amazing and that is totally okay. Card is great. Restoration Gearsmith is a black, white, and two generic mana for a 3-3 uncommon human artificer. And when Restoration Gearsmith enters the battlefield, return target artifact or creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Fantastic. It's just the best grave digger ever. And if you're in black and white, this is the card you want. If you're not in a color combination, this is going to kind of help steal you there. Like, it's value on value. It's a hill giant that's going to get you back your best artifact and or creature. It gives you all the choices. You're in an artifact block, so all your artifacts should be pretty sweet. Otherwise, if they answered your best vehicle, for example, you get to come and get it back. Like, Restoration Gearsmith has the right ability and the right stats and is on the right part of the curve and has some good power and toughness. Like, there's ways that this card could have been a lot worse that Wizards did not make it, and I appreciate that. This could have been a 2-2, for example. And we would have been like, wow, you still like... Like, it's cool, it's a little, you know, it's a little weak, but, you know, it could be better, blah, blah, blah. No, no, Restoration Gearsmith is awesome and is super playable in any deck that can play it. Uh, simple as that. I don't see it happening in Constructed because of the low power and toughness to the mana cost, and that effect isn't quite as amazing in Constructed as it is in a world of Limited, but in Limited, man, wow. However... Sahili Rai is next. A blue, red, and a generic mana for a three loyalty mythic planeswalker. Plus one, she scries one. She deals one damage to each opponent. Minus two, you create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. That token gains haste and you exile it at the beginning of the next end step. And finally, minus seven, you search your library for up to three artifact cards with different names, put them onto the battlefield, and then shuffle your library. So... She's a three-mana walker. She's a three-mana Azet walker, or an Izzet, if you will. My apologies. So she's in blue. She's in red. Her plus one is kind of eh, but they kind of have to be. Now, come on. These are three-mana planeswalkers. They can come out on turn three on the play when all you have is two mana. You have to be able to answer something that goes up to four loyalty on turn three, and you get your turn three, and you're like, uh. And then all of a sudden, it's minus two, can copy anything, get all those sweet inner the battlefield effects, which there are a billion of in this set. And that's sort of how she protects herself. She creates a copy of whatever is going to protect her, so you can still get in, you can still get that value when you copy, you can still get all the inner the battlefield effects, but it's able to stay back, the actual creature that she copied, stay back and protect Sahili. So Sahili is totally sweet. I don't know. You know, if, if it can get there in Vintage. I think people are really looking for Vintage to say, well, Dak Faden's a card. Dak Faden versus Sahili. A lot of people say Dak Faden is still just too good versus what she does versus what he does, but it's copying artifacts as well, which is a big deal in Vintage. That's really cool to me. Do I think it could get there in any other constructed format? Maybe. You just can't. You can't ever write off three mana planeswalkers. There's there's just too much goodness there. Now, you can certainly write off two mana planeswalkers like Tabalt when they're just like, and even that one was exciting. Now, it sucks, don't get me wrong, and it's easy to look in the lens, you know, the, the hindsight of 2020 and go like, duh, it's terrible. But you know, we never play with a two mana planeswalker. Well, we know how good three mana planeswalkers are, and we know how good they could be. So I think it's important to recognize that, yeah, the first ability is kind of eh, but it is slow incremental advantage, the exact type of thing you want in a blue red deck, particularly one that may be spell heavy. Um, and be able to copy anything that you have with all the sweet come into play bonuses, you know, whether it's uh, Whirler Rogue, for example, would be fantastic. And if you're in modern, you're able to copy Worm Coil Engines or something. Like, you know, what I mean, it's easy to pick like best creatures with come into play abilities and get them. But giving you any option to copy those during your turn is very good. So Healy Rye is amazingly playable, you know, easily first pickable, easily playable and sealed no matter if you're even anywhere close to blue and red. You can stretch to play a Planeswalker group because they're always awesome and they're always worth it. Uh, Constructed is the big question mark. I would love to see her in Constructed. I really would. Uh, I just don't expect it. Unlicensed Disintegration is a red, black, and a generic mana for an uncommon instant that destroys target creature. If you control an artifact, Unlicensed Disintegration deals three damage to that creature's controller. So the insult and the injury. This is terminate without the regeneration clause. You know why? Because there is no regeneration, so who cares? Like terminate plus a mana, and you can also deal three to their face if they have an artifact is fantastic. If you're anywhere near black and red, it's playable. I think we'll start to hear this kind of over and over again. If you're near these color combinations, they're giving you a payoff. All of these cards are payoffs. Black and red, I mean, they get the best removal, and this is the best removal. It's not only the best removal, it's like the removal of the slap in the face. Uh, could it get there in Constructed? 
maybe if there's a black red aggro deck this is clearly a four of because again you want to deal damage to their face and you want to kill things and this does both of those things uh so yeah easily playable all the time and limited an amazing pick uh something that you have to be worried about or something you should you should be aware of if you try to sort of pack one pick one get this because then you really shoehorn yourself into a certain color combination so you got to be wary there but again easily the best removal in the set Probably one of the best removal spells in, san in standard. Uh, you know, unlicensed disintegration is is pretty sweet. Veteran motorist is next. A red and a white for a three-one uncommon dwarf pilot. When it enters the battlefield, scry two. And whenever veteran motorist it crews a vehicle, that vehicle gets plus one plus one until end of turn. Ladies and gentlemen, the most awkward random ability ever on a creature in Kaladesh is easily by far not close. Veteran motorist. Why does it scry two? I don't understand. What what about this card says it should be scrying? Why is he looking into the future? Why is he helping you out in that way? Why wasn't just the second ability good enough? Why couldn't he have something weird like I don't know vigilance or I don't know, haste or something? I don't. I mean, you know, I, it's so strange. Why is he scrying? I don't understand it. Because the rest of the card is fine. The rest of the card is good. It's playable. It's a two man three one. Okay, it's a little, it's a little bit vulnerable. But that's not what you want to do with veteran motors. Veteran motorist obviously goes, you know, as a motorist with motor vehicles that you have in this set. So play him with all the vehicles. You can still play him in a red white deck. You're not going to be super upset or unhappy. But you know, this is a guy that uh, uh, has the most random ability ever. So congratulations, Wizards. You have completely stumped me as to why in the world this has Scry two. I got nothing. Voltaic Brawler is next, a red-green 3-2 uncommon human warrior. When Voltaic Brawler enters the battlefield, you get two energy counters. And whenever it attacks, you may pay an energy counter. And if you do, it gets plus one, plus one, and gains trample until end of turn. Note, you can only use that once. The reason you can only use it once is because this guy is incredibly pushed. This card is constructed worthy, in my opinion. It is absolutely clearly playable and limited. It's easily pickable early, so you can sort of build your green-red energy deck. It is a linchpin of the constructed energy deck, I think, if there is one. A 2-mana 3-2 essentially turns into a 2-mana 4-3 Trampler, which can do that twice. So for two turns you get that benefit. Like, this card is awesome. This card is is priced to move. This card is priced to hit a constructed environment, in my opinion, uh, and is clearly good enough in any limited deck that is anywhere close to green and red. Whirler Virtuoso is next. A red, blue, and a generic mana for a 2-3 Uncommon Valdalkan Artificer. When it enters the battlefield, you get three energy counters. You may pay three energy counters, colon, to create a 1-1 colorless thopter artifact creature token with flying. So it's a three mana 2-3 two, three that makes a 1-1 one, one for free. So it's sort of, you want to think about it, you know, a three mana 3-4, three, except one part of it flies, for God's sake. Plus, it's able to use and abuse all of your other energy counters that you're able to get plenty from when you're in red, sort of in blue, but not, not as many, in my opinion, that you kind of get in red. Um, to make Thopters and make them as many times as you have three energy counters, which I think is going to happen quite a bit. Like this card is good not only to be able to fuel your existing energy counting user, energy counter using creatures, whatever those happen to be, or whatever those artifacts happen to be, or anything that needs a activation cost in that regard. Uh, but you're able to just have this amazing activated ability at any time to produce a chump blocker, to make a guy at the end of their turn so you can attack in the air. Like there is a lot of upside to this guy. This is a, clearly a good payoff in blue and red. This is the card you want to have when you're in that archetype, and it's the card you want to have if you're in limited anywhere near these colors just kind of like the rest of them uh, virtuoso whirler virtuoso is great and this is one of those amazing cards that you get late in the draft and you go oh i'm playing blue red nobody else is because these are the kind of cards you get late when that happens now we're going to move on to the artifacts which we begin with accomplished automaton a seven mana five seven common artifact creature who is a construct with fabricate one so a seven mana six eight a seven mana five seven that could be a five seven and a one one this card is bad because it's too expensive it's expensive and it's also expensive so if you're playing it in sealed you probably shouldn't be because it's tough to get to seven mana if it is your only seven drop if it is the only thing you're doing at that high of a curve if it's the last card in your mana curve and this is the best you got Really? You can't come up with something else? But if it's the best you got, I can understand. But I'm telling you, rarely does a card like this work out. The card looks neat, sounds cool, 
Sounds like it's like a really cool ability and it's a big monster dude and five seven derp derp. It's just seven drops rarely if ever work out. Rarely do you even ever get there. Uh, and so a card like this for seven mana has to do a whole lot, and this does almost nothing. It makes a one one or it makes itself a little bit bigger. And at that point, it's just gonna be chump blocked forever. So I don't like this card. I really really play it. I don't like playing it in any format. Either Flux Reservoir is a four generic mana rare artifact that whenever you cast a spell, you gain one life for each spell you've cast this turn. You may pay 50 life, colon, Either Flux Reservoir deals 50 damage to target creature or player. You know what my favorite part is? That you can hit a creature. <laughs> I want to deal 50. I'm going to pay 50 life to deal 50 to that thing. I hate that creature so much. I'm going to deal 50 to his face. That's insane. <laughs> a silly card. Absolutely ridiculous. Made for like a Soul Sister deck. Made for your casual commander decks that gain infinite life and stuff. Like, this is a card that's silly. It's cute. It's got a really neat ability. So let's talk beyond the silliness. That that second ability it just might as well not be there for any other intensive purposes beyond casual, fun silliness. It's just not going to get there and construct it. However, uh, as a card that gains you a life for every spell that you cast this turn, for what it's worth, it could probably add up if you're playing against an aggressive deck. I certainly could understand playing this in sealed uh, against an aggressive deck, sort of bringing it in from the sideboard. I would not start with it by default. I just don't think the ability is sort of good enough, strong enough for a very long period of time able to kind of get you there. Um, but... You know, certainly these small incremental advantages over time, every time you cast a spell, just make sure you remember to, you know, catch your trigger. Uh, but otherwise, you know, either Flux Reservoir is a super neat, casual goodness card, which I like and appreciate. Either Works Marvel is next, a four generic mana mythic legendary artifact. Whenever a permanent you control is put into a graveyard, you get an energy counter. You may tap, pay six energy, colon, look at the top six cards of your library. You may cast a card, note, not put, in the, not, not put on the battlefield, cast a card from among them without paying its mana cost. You put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Frank Carson did an amazing article where he showed that you could get this thing going off consistently on, like, what, turn four or turn five, and with the amount of Ulamogs and like Kozilex and Emrakuls or whatever that you stuff in your deck. Like it is realistic to make this thing go off and make it happen. And note, it doesn't sacrifice itself. That ability can be done next turn. Like, oh, I didn't find an Emrakul this time. Oh, that sucks. Next time I'll just boop, boop, get six energy and then tap. And there's, that's it. There's, it's only you paying the energy. There's no mana cost in there. It's just tap the artifact, pay the energy. Like that's really powerful. This card to me was made to create an art and an whole an entire archetype around itself. Now, maybe that doesn't happen. Maybe Frank was just being silly and I'm getting too excited about a card that lets you play free stuff, but you get to cast all these things. So every cast trigger that is the one that you get, and all of the freaking weirdo old draws you have cast triggers, and this lets you get those cast triggers. As you play anything in the top six for free to the top six too like you know let's let's remember here you know collect a company like that was a card and we kind of said like it was good and it was powerful and these numbers are kind of high you know kind of than higher than your average bear i'm just saying i'm just saying i'm not saying this collect a company i'm explaining that it looks at a lot of cards collect a company looked at six cards and i was like whoa and you can go back and check it out when i saw that card i was like that is more than I was expecting, and that's impressive. This is more than I was expecting, particularly in that it doesn't sacrifice itself when you use it, and you still get energy whenever your stuff dies, whenever any permanent is put into a graveyard. It kind of fuels itself, basically, at that point, and that's kind of scary. Like, this thing has to be answered, essentially, but otherwise it's going to start giving you free spells, which is very, very powerful. It's incredibly powerful, basically, in any format. I mean... Any format in a world, well, any standard constructed format, limited, whether it's draft or whether it's sealed. Like, this to me is a huge sealed bomb. Absolutely massive. It lets you play anything and it doesn't sacrifice itself. I just, I'm just saying. I think this card is incredibly good and could very well be rocking standard very, very soon. Next up is Animation Module, a one generic mana rare artifact. Whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are placed on a permanent you control, you may pay a generic mana. And if you do, you create a one one colorless servo artifact creature token. Three generic mana, tap, colon, choose a counter on target permanent or player, give that permanent or player another counter of that kind. 
So that's pretty cool. And there's a whole selection of these that we'll see as we kind of go through here. There's three, there's three sort of modules that go together. <coughs> Excuse me. And they go together so well that they actually form a panorama. And they don't only form a panorama, they form a 360 degree panorama. If you were to put the end of one painting to the end of another painting and kind of, you know, curve it around, you'd have a nonstop image, which I think was really kind of amazing. Uh, as for the card itself, uh, it, it it's okay. It's weird. Like, it's fine. Would I play it in sealed just to see what it did? Absolutely. Do I think it's a little slow for draft? Probably. But maybe there's a weird sort of archetype, a weird sort of artifact driven archetype that you could use to really take advantage of it. I can certainly see that. Uh, it just seems a little kind of narrow. It seems like a fun sort of Johnny esque type of silly card for casual. I do not see this thing in constructed at all. Maybe it's decent and limited. It's obviously better and sealed in a world where you're able to slow things down and kind of have time and mana to make this type, kind of stuff happen. In that regard, it's much better. It's much better in sealed than it is draft, I think, because draft is often faster. And this is a card that does not want a fast environment. This is a card that wants you to slow down and chill and pay three mana to get more counters and stuff and then pay an extra mana to do a thing and this stuff. You know, just it takes some time. So in that regard, good and sealed, not so great everywhere else, in my opinion. Ara Dara Express. I think I screwed this up when I was talking about vehicles last. Ara Dara Express is now a much cooler name now that I'm saying it the right way. Is a five generic mana, eight, six common artifact vehicle. It has menace and crew four. Crew being, as we get to our first vehicle, you tap any number of creatures you control with total power of whatever the crew number is or more. This vehicle becomes an artifact creature until end of turn. So it's a little weird that vehicles have power and toughnesses that only matter when you crew them. They don't really say that by default. They don't say something like, you know, this is a non-creature artifact until activated or whatever sort of random, you know, reminder text you would use sort of in the old days to say things that are kind of explained elsewhere. Uh, but... Eridara Express is super, first of all, there's a train, there's Snowpiercer and Magic, that's amazing. But as an 8-6 that crews for four with Menace, like this thing is, is a kind of a house. <laughs> if you have like a larger than life, this thing's like, it's what, like a, it's like a 12-10 or something with Menace and then it would have Trample at that point, woo! It does not take long for the train to leave the station to magical Christmas land, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Like, whoo, five mana, eight, six. My God, that's some big old stats. Big enough to make me think that it might not be too good to go all in on multiple copies, but my Lord, am I running a copy just to see how good, how good this guy is? You 100% believe it. I think vehicles are the real deal. I think the ones that they push, they push for constructed, and we're going to see them there. We'll talk about them here in a minute. But this guy is, I don't think you sleep on this guy too long in limited. I think in sealed, it's fan freaking fantastic because it becomes one of the biggest, best creatures you got. But in, you know, in draft, maybe it's a little slow, but my God, eight, six minutes. This thing is, is ready to chomp some people's faces off and just run them right over. Uh, with any sort of pump spell, it becomes amazing because with an 8-6 with Menace, you know they're going to be throwing multiple creatures in front of this thing, and any sort of pump should save your dude. And saving this vehicle for another round is going to be super scary for your opponent. Oh, man, this card's so sweet. I love Eridara Express. Ballista Charger is a 5 generic mana, 6-6 six, six uncommon vehicle. When it attacks, it deals 1 damage to target creature or player, and you crew it for 3. So a 5 mana guy that turns into a 6-6 six, six that has a special ability when it's attacking. This card is very good. This card is very playable. It's not, you know, again, it's it's expensive. But I think the payoff is there as a 6-6 six, six that gets to deal with damage and kill one of their servos, basically. So it can't chump block your dude, which is what they're going to want to do. They're going to want to throw a little 1-1 one, one servos in here and it like has the, <laughs> kind of the sort of has the built-in ability to get rid of stupid chump blockers. And like eventually they're probably going to run out. And now you have a 6-6 six, six that continues to attack for only crew of three. Uh, I think this card is good, is playable, much better in sealed than it is in draft just because of speed reasons. But I think it is playable in both of those areas. I don't see this thing in standard or any further constructed format, but I do think it is very good and limited. Next up is Bastion Mastodon, is a five generic mana, four or five common artifact creature elephant. For one white colon, it gains vigilance until end of turn. So there's a bunch of, there's a whole sort of variety of these artifacts in this set, artifact creatures that had activated abilities based on colors of mana. Now the Mastodon kind of gets the boring, give it vigilance, okay. Sometimes Vigilance is much better than it looks. Vigilance is often this like weird random ability that's kind of thrown on white cards or white activated cards uh, and isn't always that 
sexy, for lack of a better word. Uh, but the Bastion here, Mr. Mastodon, he's okay. I mean, we talked earlier about a giant in red that was a four or five minutes for five, and we were like, eh, well, I was like, eh, it's all right. This one, it's okay. If you need a five drop, you don't have it, that's good. If you're in white, it kind of tips the scales if you're kind of one or between one or the other. Uh, would I, I wouldn't play it over that four or five giant with menace, for example, because it has menace, which is a better ability than vigilance, let alone the vigilance I have to pay for. But if I'm looking for a five drop, I need it on the curve. Uh, this is a card that is playable. You just don't want to play hardly any of it if you don't really have to. Bowmet Bazaar Barge is a four generic mana, five, five uncommon vehicle. When, Baz when Bowmet Bazaar Barge enters the battlefield, you draw a card and it crews for three. Uh, I think this card is incredibly good. Uh, I think it's incredibly playable. I think it's I think it is the right stats when it needs to be uh, for draft in terms of turn four. If you play this thing and you draw a card, and next turn you're able to activate it into a five five. That's very good and sealed. It, it's it's just that much better. It goes into any sealed deck that you have. It doesn't matter. I would play it in every sealed deck that I have because it's going to cancer up at worst. It's going to turn into a five five. It's going to be a threat that has to be answered. It's a four mana five five if you want to think of it that way. But really, it's just an efficient card that not only gives you not only replaces itself but gives you a 5-5 five, five that doesn't have to put your 2-2 two, two and your 1-1 one, one, or your 3-3 three, three into harm's way until they deal with that 5-5. Five, five. I think this card is very sweet, very playable, uh, easily pickable early in draft, and goes into your draft decks and all of your sealed decks. <clears throat> Bomat Courier is next, a one generic mana rare 1-1 one, one artifact creature construct. It has haste, and whenever it attacks, you exile the top card of your library face down. You do not look at it. It says right there you don't look at it. So cut that out. For one red, you may discard your hand and sacrifice Bomat Courier to put all cards exiled with Bomat Courier into their owner's hands. Uh, nah, I don't like it. <laughs> you know, uh, there is a world where when you play all the cards in your hand, you pay a red, you sacrifice the courier, and then you get all those cards, and that's amazing. So in that facet, in that instance, it sounds good. In every other instance beyond I played it on turn one, I got to attack for at least two turns, and some point later in the game, after this 1-1 one, one could not chump block because I wanted to get value out of it, I had to pay a red to hopefully get cards back from the, whatever was face down to my hand, hope it's better than whatever I discard, or hope that I don't have any cards in hand so it doesn't matter. dop a dop a dop a dop a dop card is bad. Don't like it. The end. Chief of the Foundry is a three generic mana, uncommon two, three artifact creature construct. Other artifact creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Now this was a uh, this was a, a creature that came over from Magic Origins uh, that I thought was cool because you know it came from Kaladesh. Here it is in Kaladesh. That's really sweet. Um, but Chief of the Foundry was good then. It's really good in an artifact block. This card is way, way better than it was before, I think because of it could just be overwhelmingly powerful sometimes and i remember playing as chief of the foundry in origins limited and it, it was already causing me problems then and it feels like it's going to cause a lot more problems now because it's pumping a lot more it's making all of your servos two twos uh it's pumping all of your vehicles it's pumping all of your other artifact creatures like this card is going to affect the board is going to be something that your opponent wants to get rid of as soon as possible this is the type of card that makes you bring in more naturalized type of effects that's how good this card is it's very powerful constructed Eh, maybe? I don't know. There's going to have to be quite the artifact beatdown or the artifact production or the servo production or the thopter production to make Chief of the Foundry a playable card in a constructed format. However, in limited, wow. In casual, wow. You know, so this card is super sweet. Cog Worker's Puzzle Knot is next, a two generic mana common artifact. It is our first Puzzle Knot, of which there are five of them. This one, when it enters the battlefield, you create a 1-1 colorless servo artifact creature token. You may pay a white and a generic mana. You may sacrifice Cog Worker's Puzzle Knot to create a 1-1 colorless servo artifact creature token. So it's kind of the weirdest, slowest, raise the alarm ever. But it does provide a dude coming. It does provide a dude going. There's sometimes reasons that you care when artifacts are in the battlefield. There's sometimes reasons when you care when things leave the battlefield. So there's ways that this card could be a lot more interesting and playable than it sees than it looks like on the surface. Um, ultimately, it's an okay card. It's actually not like unplayable or anything. Uh, it, you are paying two mana for a one one. Okay, you are paying more mana, so you get another one one. All right, 
again, you want to have other things happening, like the art, like the black blue guy that lets you scry when you, when an artifact enters the battlefield. Like that would be pretty sweet. You actually get to scry twice thanks to this card. That would be cool. You know, there's different types of little things that matter in that regard. Like if you're playing Chief of the Foundry, this card gets better because it makes a two two, and then when it dies, it makes another two two. So that's great. So, you know, there's it's not necessarily unplayable, but you got to look at this thing in context because on its surface it is unplayable. But when you look at all the other things it could do, all the other things it could trigger and the ways it could work in your deck, that's what brings it from unplayable to playable. So take a look at what you got. Pay attention. You'll do well. Consulate Skygate is next. A two generic mana 04 common wall. It has Defender and Reach. Not actually that bad, to be honest. Uh, as an 04 Reach... For two mana now this is a card that is in the sideboard it should live in your sideboard don't start at main deck it's not that good but if they're playing a lot of flyers a lot of creatures with evasion this is a card that you can bring in and not really feel bad about it's a card that kind of has to be answered in order for their flyers to really get through or any flyer you know lower than four power is going to have to deal with consulate skygate so i think it's easily it, it's easy to, to dismiss this card but it does have a lot of usage and it really is good in these scenarios in which it's good Cultivator's Caravan is a three generic mana 5-5 five, five rare artifact vehicle that taps to add one mana of any color to your mana pool and you crew it for three. Wow, this card is fantastic. This card is the best mana lith ever. Mana lith was a three mana artifact that tapped for any color. This thing also becomes a 5-5. Five, five. Oh, BT dubs, it not only takes you from three mana to five mana, it gives you a 5-5 five, five in the middle of all that. Like, <laughs> This card is incredibly good. This card is incredibly powerful. Not only does it fix all of your mana problems, it accelerates you and it gives you a 5-5 on top of it. My God, this is easily one of the best cards for limited in the set. Could very well hit constructed. Would not be surprised at because of the power of it. It's just like, you know, it's going to sit around, it's going to make some mana, and then, oh, by the way, it becomes a 5-5 and smashes your face. So that is important to know. Uh, this, this card is very, very good and is easily first pickable in limited because it's going to go in any deck. It's going to go in literally any deck that you play. In limited, this card will go in it. It will fix your mana and it will be awesome every single time. This card is great. Next up is Deadlock Trap, a three generic mana rare artifact that enters the battlefield tapped. When it enters the battlefield, you get two energy counters. You may tap and pay an energy to tap target creature or planeswalker. Its activated abilities can't be activated this turn. So it doesn't let you use it the turn that you play it, which is weird. A little weird? Weird. But every other turn, you may tap Planeswalkers, which has literally never happened before, beyond like a thing that says tap a permanent. We've never had on a magic card tap a Planeswalker. That's a little weird. And I would love to be wrong because, again, I think it's just weird to all get out. But... Tapping to not only tap the creature or the planeswalker, but its activated abilities can be activated this turn is really neat because you sh you shut down all the problems on their upkeep. You shut down their planeswalker. Like that's when you're supposed to trigger this. Just to be clear, before they draw, you say, "Excuse me, uh, your sweet Chandra of you know torture defiance that you open in your seal pool. No, thank you. My rare will answer your rare." And it's cool because it's clearly, you know, the story spotlights down there on the bottom, the three of five. You can see Chandra's trapped in some way, and this is behind her, and she's all, like, you know, super nature pissed and stuff. Um, which is cool in that regard. It does give you energy, so it is very playable in, in that sort of fashion. I mean, it's a good card. It's a card I'm going to play in sealed. It's a card I'm going to play in draft because it taps creatures. It stops activated abilities. It stops problems. If, if they do get a Planeswalker for, for whatever reason, this gives you two turns of reprieve plus every turn you can use it with energy counters. There's plenty of energy counters floating around. We've seen them this whole review. This card is going to shut down their best thing over and over and over again. And sometimes it might just shut down their Planeswalker for the rest of the game game can you imagine how frustrating that would be <laughs> nice chandra you got there can't use it go you know that's the beginning of your upkeep can't use it go you know just over and over and over again uh i don't see it in i could possibly see this in constructed i'll be honest i think it's i think it's probably a lot more powerful than people are giving it credit for uh shutting down planeswalkers is a thing tapping creatures is a thing not letting those creatures use their abilities is often a thing but more than likely, it's not going to get there. It's just a little too marginal. It doesn't really do enough by itself. But in a world where we're playing red-green energy decks and red-green energy decks just want to turn things sideways, get energy counters, and keep that rolling, this gives energy counters coming. It uses energy counters in a really interesting way um, and I think is inherently powerful all by itself. 
Decoction module is next, a two generic mana uncommon artifact that whenever, an inter whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you get an energy counter. Four generic mana tap colon, return target creature you control to its owner's hand. I like this card a lot, actually. I think in contrast to the other module, this module is incredibly playable because every time you play a dude, you get an energy. That's great, but you're able to return your best enter the battlefield cards over and over and over again. Every enter the battlefield trigger that you have from the moment you cast this until whenever they deal with it or those creatures, you're able to, at the end of their turn, like, oh, you didn't do anything? Okay, great, I'll pick it up. And then I'll play it again and I'll get the super, the sweet ability. Or, oh, I'll pick it up and I'll do fabricate. And go ahead. End of your turn. Oh, I'll pick it up and I'll do fabricate again. You know, once you get to a certain loop to a certain point, this card starts to get really annoying. It is a little bit slow. You can't play every copy you get and you can't expect it to be amazing on its own because it's not. It really needs something to enable it. So don't go crazy, but certainly look at this when you're playing and you're building your decks and you're thinking about the number of artifacts that you need. And most certainly when you look at how many enter the battlefield abilities that you have on your creatures because it makes it a lot more playable when that is existing. Next up is Demolition Stomper, a six mana 10-7 uncommon vehicle. Cannot be blocked by creatures with power two or less and it crews four five. I would love to play this all day. I just, I don't, I love it. I just, I think it's sweet. It's a six drop. Yes, it's a six drop, but it is a monster six drop. It has problems, you know, they can't block it with their little dorks. They have to deal with it somehow. They're going to have to lose a three power or higher creature just to stop it. And they're going to stop it. They're not going to take 10 damage, but this card is the type of thing where you're just like, I'm going to keep these creatures tapped over here and every turn I'm going to hit you in the face until you're dead. This is very much an abyss-like card where every turn they have to deal with it by sacrificing a creature or using a spell to tap it or something because the Demolition Stomper ain't messing around. You know what I'm saying? Whew, this card is very good. I like this card a lot. Dukara Peafowl. Dukara Peafowl is a four generic mana, two four common artifact creature bird. For one blue colon, it gains flying until end of turn. So uh, I think this card is good. I think it is good for its mana cost. It's a 2-4. I think you want to give it evasion, which is fine. It's fine on the ground as a 2-4 if it needs to be. But ultimately, you're going to pay a blue to get it in the air and get it across with evasive damage because that's the benefit and the upside of this type of card. I would not play it in a world, in any deck, where I do not have blue mana. It is not worth it. It is worth it because you're able to give it evasion. If you can't give it evasion, don't play it. Simple as that. Good, better in sealed than in draft, just for mana curve type costs, you know, uh, the ability to craft your mana curve and draft is better than in seal where you kind of sort of take what you get. So when you take what you get, this is very good. And, and as long as you have blue mana, uh, when you can sort of say what I want my four drop to be often, this is not going to be it. And clearly it doesn't get anywhere constructed. Dynavolt Tower is next, a three generic mana rare artifact. Whenever you cast an instant spell, I'm sorry, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you get two energy counters. Tap, pay five energy, Dynavolt Tower deals three damage to target creature or player. Now, as we've seen, it doesn't take a lot to get energy. And this guy is really amazing with not a ton of energy. Like, five energy is doable. Having the ability to tap to deal three damage to target creature player, like Lightning Bolt for five energy, is pretty positive. And if you're able to play any instance or sorceries, it's giving you basically free energy. It's not necessarily a build around me rare, but it's certainly a good complement. And if it is, if you have just just a if you have maybe six or seven cards that make energy when they enter the battlefield or make energy in some fashion i think this card is easily playable and as long as you have at least six or seven good instance or sorceries you know that's going to trigger this thing it's going to be i think it's going to be solid now i want to play with it just to see i think clearly it's better in draft where you're able to craft your deck to have a lot of energy and know that you're able to use energy in the right way but in sealed i don't think it takes a lot of enablers to make this card very very good so be aware of that and just rock on, Dynavolt Tower. The card is sweet. It looks awesome. It's got freak electrical fingery things. It's just, just sweet. So I love the look. I love the card. I love the ability to tap and make lightning bolts for five energy. Eager Construct is next. A two generic mana, two, two common artifact creature construct. When it enters the battlefield, each player may scry one. Huh. Well, there was a, there was an artifact creature. That was a two mana two two that when it died, both players drew a card. Now that card was playable in a way because you were able to get a two mana two two in any deck in any sort of build. You were able to really kind of determine when you wanted it to die 
because then you could both then you could draw a card and replace itself. Uh, and by the time that happened, often it wasn't a big deal because you timed it in the right way. You were able to, you know, you were able to tell when that trigger happened. This card I don't like because of the exact opposite. Both of you get the benefit immediately. There was no way to kind of time it in a way where their scry wouldn't matter or time it in a way when you really needed that scry because a two mana two two, you often want to play on turn two. So if I am hurting, and I mean hurting, hurting, for two drops, I'll play it, but I don't want to. If I'm in a very aggressive deck, I don't really want to play this either because if you're an aggressive deck and you're trying to get there on you know, on your mana curve or whatever, and you're giving the other deck who may not be an aggressive deck a better draw, be able to filter through what they're drawing next or and or, and or get them out of mana screw or whatever, like that's it's a little dangerous, honestly, in terms of the way that you want to win the game. So in that regard, I don't like this creature very much. I don't want to play it unless I absolutely have to. Electrostatic Pummeler is next, a three generic mana rare 1-1 one, one artifact creature construct. When it enters the battlefield, you get three energy counters. You may pay three energy counters, and it gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is its power. So clearly, there is a string of cards and pump spells that you could play that would turn this from a 1-1 one, one into a super monster, and then three energy counters later, and it's absolutely you know gigantic and ridiculous. That's sweet. But... Ultimately, you have to work really hard for that one bonus. It's nice that it gives energy counters. It's nice that you can take advantage of that. It certainly would be great if you're able to, you know, give this guy a plus four, plus four, and trample, and then double his, you know, and then double his power, and then be able to use it again because you got more energy in the meantime. But that's a lot of ifs and ands and buts, and I hope he gets trampled because if it doesn't get trampled, it's just going to get chumped off by a one one, and this card is bad otherwise. The card's probably pretty bad. I wouldn't suggest playing with it. Fabrication Module is next, a three generic mana uncommon artifact. Whenever you get one or more energy counters, you put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. And four mana, tap, I'm sorry, four generic mana, tap, colon, you get an energy counter. That's pretty sweet. Not only are you able to generate energy, you're able to generate advantage. You're able to generate advantage, certainly for cards and archetypes that rely or care about plus one plus one counters, particularly green cards. So, I think this card is sweet. I think it's costed at the right amount. It's not a two mana artifact and then, you know, you're getting an energy counter, um, you know, with your three drop and you put in the counter and you're getting something with your four drop and you put in the counter. Uh, you know, you have to use your third turn or at least three mana to get this guy out. You have to use four mana, so a total of seven in order to get one energy counter and one plus one plus one counter. So that's important to kind of recognize and keep in your mind space because I don't really like this thing in multiples, but as a one of, I think it's perfect. It's going to be amazing in sealed. Not so great in draft because draft is faster and this is kind of slow. Um, but in the red blue, I'm sorry, in the black blue type control deck that we spoke of a few times, this is the type of card that's perfect in that deck. Just absolutely does what you want it to do. You kind of sit back, you're able to put counters, you're able to gain energy, you're able to get incremental advantage. And those are the decks that want this type of card. And in sealed, everyone is almost kind of by default close to a mid range to a control deck depending on what they're doing. And this card is perfect in either of those archetypes, which means it's perfect in sealed. But just don't go nuts. Just run the one. You'll be happy. Filigree Familiar is next. A three generic mana, two, two uncommon artifact creature, Fox. And when it enters the battlefield, you gain two life. And when it dies, you draw a card. This card's great. <laughs> this card's fantastic. Like, did, did I miss something? This, this card's great. And I think constructed playable. I really do think this card could see constructed play and it doesn't take that much because you can emerge creatures and when you emerge creatures you're able to sacrifice them. This gives you a card back. Well as long as you're playing an Eldrazi that it reduced the cost by three mana while it did so. You know this card is sweet. This card is incredibly playable. You play it in every single limited format you can. It's easy to draft early. It, it's always a great three drop. It's amazing and sealed. It's exactly what you want to do. And three mana is to play something that not only could maybe trade with something, but it's going to replace itself no matter what. And later in the game, you're able to gain some life and you're able to see, hey, look, I can run this into the red zone. If they block it and kill it, then I'll get to draw a card and I'm okay with that. So, and, and the picture is absolutely adorable. Look at that thing. Just look at it. Fire Forger's Puzzle Knot is a two generic mana common artifact that when it enters the battlefield, it deals one damage to target creature or player. You may pay a red and two generic mana and sacrifice it to deal one damage to target creature or player. Marginally playable and limited. I don't really like to main deck it. I think trying to rely on five mana to deal two damage at any one time is a stretch. Only... I mean, you know, sort of, all right, so what scenarios are we talking about in which this is a good effect? It's a good effect when they're playing a lot of fabricate slash servo cards, right? You know, that's making a lot of servo tokens. Okay, 
But at that point, if this is your option, you can say, well, I won't use my fabricate to make servos if my opponent has a fire forger's puzzle on, right? So we can kind of think through this. So it's a little marginal in what it's going to be killing and when it's going to be killing it. It's a lot of mana for what it does, and it's one of the worst, to be honest, in terms of the puzzle knots. I don't like this one very much. Fleetwheel Cruiser, I love. It is a four generic mana, 5-3 rare artifact vehicle. It has trample and haste. When it enters the battlefield, it becomes an artifact creature until end of turn, and it crews for two. Only two. Wow. This thing is push. This thing will see constructive play. I expect to see this thing at the Pro Tour. A four mana, 5-3 haste that doesn't need to be crewed to the first turn it enters the battlefield. Next turn, you power it up with whatever. As long as it has two power, you could play another one. You could smash in for 10 at that point. Like This card was pushed. This card was supposed to see play, in my opinion. They wanted vehicles to impact constructed, and numbers like this, abilities like that, will get you there 100% a million like just infinitely playable and limited it doesn't matter if you're sealed draft aggro control card is good coming and going fleet wheel cruiser is amazing i love that thing foundry inspector is next a three generic mana three two uncommon artifact creature construct and artifact spells you cast cost one generic mana less cost or i'm sorry one generic mana less to cast Whew. All right, so Foundry Inspector is sweet. It's right. It's on the right spot in the curve. It's able to make all of your stuff cheaper. That's always a good thing. It's it's more or less, it's hard to say no to this card. It's hard to say that you shouldn't play this card because it's aggressive and then it's three power for three mana. It has the right abilities because it, it makes all your artifacts cheaper in an artifact block. And if you have a lot of artifact creatures, clearly you want to make this guy, you know, sort of help those out as much as possible. And I think your opponent's going to want to kill this thing as quickly as possible, particularly if you get it out on turn three on the play, because to be able to drop a five mana artifact on turn four will be something to, you know, it will be something that, that they are going to be concerned with. You know what I'm saying? So uh, so good in sealed, good in draft. Don't see it in constructed, just not the right stats for it. But in the in the formats where it shines, it shines very bright. Girapur Ori is a four generic mana rare artifact where each player may play an additional land on each of their turns. And at the beginning of each player's upkeep, if that player has no cards in hand, that player draws three cards. Stay away from this card if you didn't build your deck from literally any magic cards that you chose, whether they're in a standard format or a casual format like Commander or a just silly casual deck that you want to play on the kitchen table or you're making some really weird cube thing or whatever. Um... Don't do it in limited. This is not a card in limited. Don't do it. Don't play it. It's going to burn you. And you're going to hate all of your life. I promise. This is exactly the type of card that makes bad beat stories. Like I played Gear Per Ori and I didn't have any cards in my hand. And then they got to draw three because of whatever instance they cast. And then they got to cast three spells because, you know, you know, screw my life, man. They had three one drop cards or whatever for whatever reason. And then I drew three lands. And I mean, you know, that, 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 this is the type of cards that make those really horrible awkward stories where you lose a lot don't play it limited play it in your silly fun casual decks your johnny decks maybe if someone wants to go crazy and construct it and make this happen in standard with something like noose constrictor maybe but i'm doubtful glass blowers puzzle knot is a two generic mana common artifact when it enters the battlefield you scry two then you get two energy counters you may pay a blue mana and two generic mana and sacrifice it to scry two and then get two energy counters so this one gives you a lot of value i like this one when you pay two you're able to scry two that matters you get energy counters that matters later you get to do it at any point in time at instant speed at the end of their turn you're able to scry two helps sort of soften your, soften your draw give you energy counters you want something in your deck that has the ability to really abuse or use energy counters in a good way if you don't have something like that for whatever reason this is the that's the only reason i can imagine not wanting to play this card because if you're able to use energy counters in almost any fashion i like glass blowers puzzle knot a lot inventor's goggles is next a one generic mana common artifact equipment a quick creature gets plus one plus two whenever an artificer enters the battlefield under your control you may attach inventor's goggles to it and you equip for two generic mana now it's interesting that there's so many artificers in this format oh my god there's still artificers that are in you know they're in uh battle for zendikar and oath of the gatewatch and shadow of the Strahd. i mean you know like the ability to uh, well not not so much battle for zendikar because we're clearly moving forward but in you know shadows of Innistrad and whatnot there are artificers they, they still exist and there's 
plenty in this that particularly the one red, one red, one drop that gives plus one, plus one when you have an artifact. So this automatically attaches to it for free. And it, all of a sudden it's a one mana three, five. That's really important. This card messes up. It messes up combat sort of in the right way in terms of it pumping the toughness. It gives you the abilities to equip for free, which is great. Don't forget your triggers. Uh, so I like this card a lot. I think this card is super sweet. I could I could definitely see it seeing constructed play because there's so many powerful, certainly aggressive artificers out there. Um, but really, if you're able to put this on a flyer, it's very powerful. You put it on your Windrake, all of a sudden it's a 3-4 flyer. That's a big deal. So, you know, it kind of pumps in the right way. If it was... Plus one plus O, oh, nope. If it's plus two plus O, oh, probably not because you need to be able to provide toughness as well as power in order to make equipment really shine. Uh, so this one really does. It's not a card I want to run a ton of, but it is a card because it's common. I could see coming around later than usual. And if you're looking at your deck and you're kind of looking at all your creature types and you're seeing Artificer, 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 this is the card where I start going like, maybe, sure. Like, I'm happy with one copy. I really am. It's just a question of whether you run more. Iron League Steed is next. A four generic mana, 2-2 two, two uncommon artifact creature construct with haste and fabricate one. So it's basically a hill giant with haste. Or a crappy hill giant with haste. Well, crappy is in a four mana, 2-2 two, two with haste. That makes a 1-1. One, one, which is okay. I think it's uncommon for a reason in that it's nice to have haste. Again, haste is an incredibly powerful ability that your opponent is just not really able to prepare for in terms of getting their creatures ready for combat. Uh, having the ability to have a 2-2 haster now and a 1-1 that can block their monster, you know, let's say they're attacking you with a 6-6, great, I'm going to get in for two and I'm going to leave back a chump blocker and I'm going to say go. So at least you're able to kind of get back in the game a little bit and still have something to deal with one of their monsters. Uh, so it gives you those options. It is good in that regard. I like this card a lot because... Because of, of those, because of that flexibility. You want the ability to say, I don't want to do this right now, I want to do that, but in this scenario, I want the 3-3 haster. In this scenario, there's no way I would want the 3-3 haster. That to me is there's power in those options and those abilities. Uh, it should be very good in an aggressive deck because a 4-4, four, 4-mana four, four 3-3 three, three haster is fine. Um, and ultimately, it's not going to get anywhere near constructed, but it's going to be really good and limited, and that's the way it should be. Key to the city is next, a two generic mana rare artifact. You tap and you discard a card, colon, up to one target creature can't be blocked this turn. Whenever key to the city becomes untapped, you may pay two generic mana. And if you do, you draw a card. Wow. Uh, this card seems really good. Uh, I like it. I like it in aggressive strategies. Clearly, you don't want to necessarily discard a card you know, all the time forever or whatever. But at the beginning of your turn, when this untaps, you pay two mana and you just drew a card. And then you're drawing another card for your turn, and you're able to activate Key to the City so their best thing can't block again. So in aggressive decks, this is very good. In sealed, I see this more as an attrition type, you know, card where you're able to say, okay, your best thing can't block, smash in. Maybe we did some trades or whatever. When it when I untap, I pay some mana so I draw some cards. Now I have the ability to stop your best thing from blocking, or they start attacking you with everything because they don't think you're going, you know, because they know that you have, you know, Key to the City, and they could make their best card or their best creature not attack or not block rather. So they're attacking with everything. So you're like, okay, you're attacking with everything, so I don't need to activate Key to the City because now I just drew an extra card basically for that two mana, and I'm happy with that. Uh, so the threat of this card is powerful, and the ability of this card is powerful. So I love it in Sealed. I'm pretty sure I like it in Draft. Uh, clearly it's better, I think, in the aggressive builds where you want to play this, tap it, discard a card immediately and stop their best thing from blocking and get in. And next turn, when you start to run out of gas, you can pay two mana. You're able to draw cards with it. You're able to stop things from blocking, which is what you want, so on and so forth. I don't see it happening in in a lot of other formats. Maybe it'll happen in Commander. Who knows? Uh, but I certainly don't see it in Standard or any format beyond Standard. Uh, but it does do something really cool to the game, which I like a lot, and I think, it, think it's super playable and limited. <clears throat> Next is Metal Spinner's Puzzle Knot, a two generic mana common artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you lose a, you draw a card and you lose a life. You may pay a black and two generic mana, you may sacrifice it then, and then draw a card and you lose one life. So this is kinda, sorta, the weirdest, slowest, think twice, that hurts you that we've ever made. Yeah. No, it's it's really cool. It's sort of a, uh, sort of a very subtle think twice type variant. That is good, goes in any deck. Clearly you want to play it with your with black cards. I, I would not want to play this if I didn't have the ability to activate it, but it's if I have the ability to activate this, I like this card a whole lot. I think it's 100% playable. I think it's good and limited regardless of draft or sealed. I would love to see it in standard. I do think it is possible to see it in standard because again, there's things that care about stuff going to, to the graveyard. Uh, there's good. It's good to be able to draw cards in that manner in a way that you can really kind of think twice 
just losing a life instead of just getting it, you know, instead of playing at sort of instant speed uh, with that spell itself. So with that regard and that flexibility, I think it's incredibly good and may be good enough for constructive play, and I would not be surprised if that's where it ends up. Metalwork Colossus is next, an 11 generic mana, 10-10 rare artifact creature construct. It costs X generic mana less to cast, where X is the total converted mana cost of non-creature artifacts you control. Sacrifice two artifacts, colon, return it from your graveyard to your hand. So I like the fact, first of all, that its second ability does not say sacrifice two non-creature artifacts. You can sacrifice two servos and get this thing back. That's awesome. It's questionable as to whether how much you're going to reduce the mana cost of this, but I don't think it's going to take a lot. And I think, as you've seen, there's plenty of non-creature artifacts that are worth playing, that are interesting. And as long as you have just a just a small smidgen of those, I think this card is playable in limited. But, you know, you got to make sure you have enough. I really think you probably need to have maybe four or five non-creature artifacts in order to make this thing really work. Because you're going to get stuck with this guy, and he's going to cost like nine. You're going to get stuck with this guy, he's going to cost like eight. And you're going to be like, oh my god, I just can't ever cast this card. So that's where the drawback really comes into place and it, it seems like a card that's built for more of a casual type feel than it is for something that you know then in limited where you're where you're having sort of a tough time making all that stuff kind of work particularly in sealed where you don't know what you're going to get maybe in draft but in draft if you're drafting non-creature artifacts in in hopes of playing this one creature well by the time you play this one creature you've played a bunch of non-creature artifacts and they've probably killed you already so where are we we have found that I don't believe this card is very playable in either format at this point because reasoning it out, I don't like it in seal because it's too random. I don't like it in draft because of how much you have to put in there to get it out. Maybe in casual constructed it could work, but I don't see it anywhere else. Uh, I, I appreciate the fact that it's a 11 mana 10-10. And I wish I could say better things about it. But the total converted mana cost of non-creature artifacts, the word non-creature was the killer. Multiform Wonder is next, a 5 generic mana rare 3-3 three, three artifact creature construct. When it enters the battlefield, you get 3 energy counters. You may pay an energy counter and it gains, well, it, and then Multiform Wonder gains your choice of flying, vigilance, or lifelink until end of turn. You may pay a energy and give it plus 2, minus 2, or minus 2, plus 2 until end of turn. So it's it's kind of super man -y, you know what I mean? Like it is very similar to a morphling type thing with energy counters, which is strange, but that's okay. It's still awesome. It can become a, if you use all three of the energy on your next turn, for example, it could fly, it can get lifelink and it could become a five one. So you have a five one flying lifelinker for five mana who leaves behind a three three, who later, if you get any energy at all, is able to use one of these abilities which is fantastic. This card is awesome. This card is super duper playable. It's great in sealed and limited. I don't see it in constructed because just the rates and whatnot that you're getting, but that's okay. This card was meant to be a very, very good limited card, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, it is super playable. I love this card a lot. Multiform Wonder is sweet. Narnam Cobra. Narnam? For real? Narnam Cobra is a two generic mana, two one common artifact creature snake. And for one green colon, it gains death touch until end of turn, which is a little weird. Wouldn't you kind of expect the black one to gain death touch? Whatever. I mean, I get the flavor clearly. It's a cobra. It's green. It's nature. You know, I understand that. <clears throat> uh, with that said, uh, it's incredibly powerful. It's very, very good. Uh, it's... It's very, very powerful and very, very good in a world where you have where you have green mana. If you don't have green mana, this isn't necessarily totally unplayable because sometimes you need a two mana two one and that's just what you need. But there's plenty of two mana two ones in this set. You really shouldn't need to kind of reach for Narnum Cobra in order to make something happen on your two drop. But if you are playing green mana, this is 100% playable all the time, every time. Death Touch is a way to stop a huge monster from attacking you or your way to get through a huge monster because they don't want to trade it for a freaking two mana two one. So Narnum Cobra is very, very good in green decks and is always playable and is easily draftable and you will love it. It's not going to get near constructed because that's not what this card is for, but in limited, this card is fantastic. Next up is the first vehicle ever revealed, Oval Chase Dragster, a four generic mana, six one uncommon artifact vehicle. It has trample and haste. It crews for one, for one power worth of creature. We'll turn this into a six one trample haste. That's awesome. I, I love that. I just, you know, <clears throat> this is Clearly, Ball Lightning was a card. Ball Lightning was three red for a 6-1 Trample Haste that died at end of turn. 
that was a very classic magic card when i first got into magic it, was, it came out in the dark and it was reprinted in one of the core sets and it was like oh my god ball lightning's insane they finally got rid of ball lightning they would never reprint ball lightning they said the ball lightning was way above the curve you know we just can't have it so we have stuff like this which is like sort of kind of similar not really ball lightning you still had to pay four mana for it not three mana you still had to tap a creature in order to crew it but then you got all that sweet ability on the end so because of its ability to have haste in you know sort of naturally you have you don't have to give it haste it just has haste like that means this card is always good and always playable because at any time you could just be like whoa congratulations i got six mana to the face or six damage to the face and then every turn thereafter they had to be prepared that you can tap one power worth of creature to make six one worth of trample haste in action and that's that's fantastic so this card is amazing in limited no question standard i don't know you know i know i think vehicles are the real deal i don't know if this vehicle is the real deal uh it is very fragile it does kind of die to all the things but i do know that in limited this guy is amazing i love this thing Panharmonicon is next, a, a four generic mana rare artifact that if an artifact or creature entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. Good God, wizards. If a thing causes a thing to trigger, it trigger triggers. All right. Uh, for what it's worth, this card is very good. It's confusing, I believe, in its wording because this is kind of awkward. But if something you play causes something else to happen that thing happens twice so sometimes as we've seen you get energy counters for doing a thing or you get plus one plus one counters for doing a thing or whatever it is so it's both going to happen on the artifact that you play and the creature that you play if it if that matters if it happens um and any other artifacts or creatures that you control uh that happen to be triggered as a result also happen again so like uh, this card has a lot of potential if you have some good enter the battlefield abilities and they don't have to be a lot of them uh, I think this card is very much playable. This is a card that I think is great in sealed because you can, you know, you kind of have the time to, to watch this thing go insane. You don't have so much time in draft, but still, the ability to get like basically double triggers off of all of your end of the battlefield abilities are just, it's its a lot. It's, it's kind of overwhelming, I would feel. Uh, I don't know. I mean, like, I think in casual constructed, this thing is amazing. Like, Commander is going to love this thing, and that is great. Um, I don't see it happening in standard construct constructed because four mana, you know, essentially do nothing slash don't affect the board is rarely ever going to get there. Uh, but in limited, this card's going to be awesome. In sealed, it's going to be an absolute all star that is going to probably win you the game soon thereafter if your opponent cannot destroy it. And if you see it, you kill that thing because oh boy, there's plenty of opportunity in the Panharmonicon. Perpetual Timepiece is next, a two generic mana uncommon artifact. You tap to put the top two cards of your graveyard. I'm sorry, the tap. <laughs> you tap to put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. You pay two generic mana and you may exile it to shuffle any number of target cards from your graveyard into your library. Really? 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 This card is bad. I'm glad I can just say this card is bad. Moving on. Prakata Pillarbug is next, a three generic mana common 2-3 that has one black colon. It gains lifelink until end of turn. So weird kind of shuffling around of the abilities on these cards, you know, like the green one got death touch and the black one got lifelink, but the white one got vigilance, which could also have lifelink, and I think you wouldn't be surprised there. I know black certainly has lifelink in it. I'm not saying that's against sort of flavor or whatever uh, or the color pie. It's just kind of silly and interesting to me sort of where the abilities went and what triggered them. Fine. Regardless, as a three mana two three that can get lifelink, this card is great. Uh, it's great when you, just like we talked about before, it's great when you have that mana ability to trigger. If you don't have the ability to trigger, or I'm sorry, to activate that ability, it's okay. It's three mana two three. At that point, you're like, I really need a three drop because like my curve is looking weird, and I need to have a three drop right here. This is a three drop. But if you are playing black black mana, this is a card that I would play every single time in sealed or draft because it's it's good on the curve. Three mana two three is fine. Getting the ability to life link is really sweet uh, and very impactful and. Whether you put an equipment on this thing, or whether you're sitting back blocking with this thing, gaining two life that way, you know, there's lots and lots of upside to this guy. I like this card a lot. 
Prophetic Prism is next, illustrated by our own Noah Bradley, who did a great job. Two generic mana for a common artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. You may pay one generic mana and tap it to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So this card is super sweet. It fixes your mana. It replaces itself. It's early in the game, so it's able to kind of get you going, if, particularly if you're land light. It can help you find more lands. It fixes your mana, of course, with uh, with its filtering ability. This card has been printed before, and there's, there's no secret as to how good it is, basically. This card is very good, very playable, uh, both in sealed, where, it, where it's an absolute all-star, or in draft where it's fine um it's it could definitely see constructed play i wouldn't be super surprised at it because again it's replacing itself it has the ability excuse me to fix your mana the way you know sort of whatever whatever mana you're looking for obviously it's able to turn it into that and you know it's a it's a good card that i'm glad to see return next up is renegade freighter yet another train toot toot five generic mana for a four three common artifact vehicle when it attacks it gets plus two I'm sorry, when it attacks, it gets plus one, plus one, and gains trample until end of turn, and it crews for two. So for two power, you can turn into a 5-4 trampler. This card is amazing. <laughs> Not quite amazing. This card is very good, though. I like this card a lot. I like vehicles a whole lot. I like playing with vehicles. I want to see them always on the battlefield. I want to activate them. I want to turn my dudes sideways to get them all up into vehicles and smash and smash. It's awesome. I definitely want to, you know, do the achievement unlocked of having a vehicle crew another vehicle because what's funnier than imagine a train driving a car? Yeah. But Renegade Freighter, I love the ability that sort of that is on the curve at three mana. And then on turn four, if you use essentially what would be your two drop to turn it into a five four trampler, that is very powerful on turn four. Uh, and at that point, you should have mana up that you can have tricks and removal spells and direct damage spells so it doesn't get destroyed. Uh, I think this card is sweet. It is good in aggressive decks. Uh, yeah, I, it's it's hard for me to argue against it at this point. Clearly, we need to see how vehicles shake out, but I like vehicles a lot. I think this card is very good and playable. I don't see it in constructed, but you know, limited limited is very good. Scrap Heap Scrounger is next. A two generic mana rare three two artifact creature construct. It cannot block. You may pay a black and a generic mana, exile another creature card from your graveyard, and return it from the graveyard to the battlefield. So this one has the good old fashioned can't block text. Uh, it was removed on things like Relentless Dead, but it didn't matter because that was bad. Uh, that card was bad, even though it looked amazing. It was still bad. Uh, this card can work with other cards that uh, there is, and there's a card, there's an Eldrazi that you can play from Exile, and that works very well with that. Um, and otherwise, it's it's pretty aggressive. I mean, this is a card that you want to be able to turn sideways. This is a card that you should never play if you don't have black mana, because it's just not going to be worth it. Uh, but if you have the ability to return it over and over, even if you're exiling creatures, oftentimes that's enough because it is high up on the it's high up on the you know power to mana ratio, where it's a three power for two mana type of dude. You want to turn them sideways, and that's awesome. But otherwise, do can this get there and constructed? Maybe, you know, again, Wizards is like just trying to make this black aggressive thing happen and it's just not happened. It's, I mean, it is the fetch of magic right now. Right now, the fetch is they just cannot make black or black red aggro work. They just can't do it. I mean, did you see Olivia? What a joke. What a joke. Ridiculous. Mobilized for war. Mobilized to sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Anyway. Self-Assembler is next. A 5 generic mana, 4-4 four, four common artifact creature assembly worker, the second only in all of magic, uh, beyond Mishra's Factory and the card assembly worker, for what it's worth. Uh, so the only the second assembly worker, the third card to reference assembly workers. Um, now I'm not sure if Ink Moth Nexus did. It doesn't matter. The point is, or Blink Moth rather, uh, the point is when it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an assembly worker creature card, reveal it, and put it into your hand, and then shuffle your library. So it's a five mana, kind of a four four Auroch. If you remember the sad, lonely days of Cold Snap, uh, you'll remember the Aurochs, and they sometimes went and found other Aurochs. And so this is a five mana four four that finds other five mana four fours. I think it's common for a reason. I don't think it's that powerful. It's not really that much higher on the mana curve than your other five mana options. Certainly colored options are a thing. Um, and as a result, I think the power level is a little bit low. Uh, it's nice that if you have two of them, you can play two of them and the one is going to get the other. That's cool. I like that. 
Um, in sealed, I could definitely see myself playing two of these if that's what I needed on my curve and I didn't have anything better to play. Uh, but if there's any creature that gets above this power and toughness, there's, if there's any creature that gets above the value that these provide other than finding other copies of themselves, there's no way I'm playing this. Uh, I would definitely play a different creature. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's worthless. That doesn't mean it's also not really sweet and popper. You could play it in Tron, for example, I think it would be cool. Uh, I don't see it happening in Constructed. Squadron Hawk was a thing because it cost two mana and had evasion and so on and so forth. It also shuffled your library and all the the other good things it did for you uh so so let's not get nuts in terms of like could this deconstruct to play it i just there's i don't think there's any way beyond a popper format and maybe not even then sky skiff is next a two generic mana two three common artifact vehicle that flies and crews for one i think this is a limited all-star i think this card is fantastic i want to play every copy i got i want to send all of my two threes in the red zone by tapping just one power worth of servo like that's what i want to do this is the card i want to see and this is the card i want to play lots and lots and lots i love sky skiff i think it's great i think it's really good and limited it's super good i think in draft we're able to really power it up and be prepared for it and have enough one power guys or enough fabricate cards that you're going to know you're going to be able to power it up on turn three when you want to. Uh, I like Sky Skiff a whole bunch. The card is totally awesome. Next up, speaking of totally awesome, my god, Sky Sovereign Console Flagship is a five generic mana mythic legendary vehicle. It is a 6-5 flyer. Whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, it deals three damage to target creature or planeswalker an opponent controls, and it only crews for three. A 6-5 flyer crews for three. And if you have the dwarf pilot, God help us all, because that card is that card is bananas anyway. It doesn't matter. You don't have to put your rare and your mythic together, you know, to crush people. Uh, this card, if I need to explain it, is amazing and limited, is unbelievably powerful, is a mythic monster will destroy your opponent and all of their hopes and dreams because it's ridiculous. Uh, it is pushed. You This is one of those cards that you want to be big and cool and amazing. I mean, they have like cardboard, like, you know, sort of cardboard 3D cutout things that they put in the stores of the console flagship itself. Like there's a reason because they want that thing to be amazing and it is amazing. Whether or not it hits... Whether or not it hits constructed, I think is a question mark. And by constructed, I mean standard. I mean, I mean, I mean tournament play. You know, constructed could also mean commander, but that's not what I'm talking about. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I think in commander, it's going to be super fun. I think any casual deck is going to love this thing. Uh, you know, it's just it's a cool, sweet, evocative, neat card. May not be the most overpowered thing, but man, it is super, super cool. Smuggler's Copter is next. It is a two generic mana, three, three rare artifact vehicle that flies. And whenever it attacks or blocks, you may draw a card. And if you do, you discard a card and it crews for one. Uh, one of the most pushed artifacts in the set, one of the most pushed vehicles, certainly. A card I definitely see a lot being played of because of its looting ability. Uh, note that it loots when you're attacking or you're blocking. Whether you're blocking, that's fine. I'll, I'll also loot. Thanks. You know, you just keep doing that. That's, that's fantastic. So... I don't see this thing happening anywhere like Affinity or whatever, like some people said. I think that's silly. But I think it was made to see standard play, and I think it's going to see standard play. It was made to be a limited all-star, and I think it's going to be a limited all-star. So I think the, the numbers are correct to make it sexy and interesting and exciting when you open it as a rare, and you want to play with it, and it feels like one of those really great rares when you get to play it. Like, Smuggler's Copter is awesome. I love it, and I would not be surprised if it saw constructive play at all. Snare Thopter is next, and this card blows my freaking mind. Look, four generic mana for a 3-2 Flying Haste. 3-2 Flying Haste. Seriously? Snapping Drake was a card, and it cost blue mana. It cost a blue and three generic mana for that 3-2 Flyer. Now, we pay four generic mana of any color to get a 3-2 Flyer, okay, that has haste. What? What? Wow, talk about your strictly better thans. This card, jeez. Uh, this card definitely fills a hole, and it's definitely uncommon for a reason. A 3-2 evasive haste creature? Wow. That is uh, that is very good. That is playable in every limited format. Not close. It's not going to go anywhere outside of it, but it is a definite, fantastic, uncommon. It goes in any deck. It doesn't matter what you're playing. This is a good card in it. Torch Gauntlet is next, a two generic mana, common artifact equipment. A quick creature gets plus two, plus zero, oh, and you equip it for two generic mana. So it's it's good. It's, you know, Bone Splitter used to be literally half the cost all the way around, but these days we have Torch Gauntlet, so we kind of have to suck it up and deal with it. Now, Bone Splitter was still a good card, and even when it's twice as expensive, I would still run it. I wouldn't run a bunch of these because now the mana cost is so high, it's hard to say that you're able to invest that much mana for that much benefit, but... As a one of in my limited decks, 
I love it for sure in draft because I'm able to draft an aggro deck that can really, you know, really want this type of card. Uh, in sealed, I still think it's a fine card because it allows things like servos to take down three toughness creatures or it allows servos to attack into a three toughness creature. And, and those are always, you know, good times. So, yes, double the cost of Bone Splitter, but it is worth it, trust me. Weldfast Monitor is next, a three generic mana, three two common artifact creature lizard. One red colon, it gains menace until end of turn. So, I like this card because in terms of on the curve, it's where you want to be. Three power for three mana. High five. Uh, the one red mana to give it menace <clears throat> is interesting. I would only play this card because I needed a three drop that has three power. You know what I mean? I need it on the curve. I don't like the menace ability that much because I just think it's going to be blocked by like a servo plus something that's not that this is not going to kill. And the servo is going to die. Okay. You know, maybe you'll have a pump spell when that happens. You probably won't. Or... Maybe you'll be able to play this and the Menace won't ever matter, which I think is a possibility. So this is the one of those cards of this entire cycle that if if you just ran it in an off-color deck, I, you know, I wouldn't wouldn't hate on you for it. You know, I'd understand. Be like, all right, it's a three-mana, three-two guy. It's fine. Whatever. It's a little meh. It's not a card I'm, I'm excited about playing, certainly whether or not it's a red deck or not. Next up is Whirler Maker in which we finally understand the cost of a 1-1 Thopter. It is a 3 generic mana uncommon artifact, 4 generic mana tap colon, create a 1-1 colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. Yeah. So, 4 mana, make a Thopter. Got it. Thopters are worth 4 mana. Understood. This is a good card. This is a card that you want in your sealed deck always. Oh my god, it's a sealed monster. But, in your draft deck, that's okay too. Uh, but ultimately, it's pretty slow. So you have to draft a deck that's able to sit back and for seven mana do nothing. And at the end of that seven mana, you do have a 1-1 one, one flyer. Okay. So take it with a grain of salt. It's certainly not going to get anywhere in Constructed, but it is appreciated in the sealed environment and it's appreciated in the control decks in the draft environment. If you're an aggro deck, you stay far away from this thing. It is not worth the cost uh, that you're able to put into this thing or that you have to put in this thing. Next up is Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot, a two generic mana common artifact. When Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot enters the battlefield, you gain three life and get three energy counters. One green, two generic mana, sacrifice it. You gain three life and get three energy counters. This card is great. This card is fantastic. This card is playable in every, this is play, playable in every limited format and it's playable in standard. And it will be a part of the standard energy deck. It is too efficient not to be played in that regard. To give five mana to gain six life and five and six life and six energy counters, that's fantastic. And those are rates that we just don't see. And the rates that we did see that were kind of above the curve, as it were, we were like, I mean, well, I was like, whoa, you know, this this is, needs to be paid attention to. This guy is way above it, way worth it. I think is absolutely going to be in any type of energy build, energy deck that you see in standard, uh, because of you know sort of its its advantages are inherent. And I think uh, Wizards really wanted to focus energy on green and green and red. And this is exactly the type of card that you want in those types of archetypes. Workshop Assistant is next and absolutely adorable. Look at that thing. Three generic mana for a common 1-2 artifact creature construct. When it dies, you return another artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. So if you have like, you know, a gear hulk in your deck, this makes this a lot more a lot more playable, a lot more powerful. Uh, if you have like either works Marvel and you're afraid that it's going to get destroyed in some way, this card gets a lot more powerful. Um, if you have a certain artifact that you want to make sure that you might be able to get back in the future or that is so, so much overpowered, if you have like a mythic like the Sky Sovereign, for example, Consul's Flagship, I will play this card. So Workshop Assistant is as playable as the best artifact in your deck. So think about that. Think about the best artifact that you have in your deck, whether it's sealed or whether it's draft, <clears throat> and it's probably going to be sealed. <clears throat> And then you say, well, okay, is it worth me putting this three mana one two dork in here just because I want to get this card back? And for Gear Hulks, I think it's 100% yes. For other cards, I think it's arguable, but not always a slam dunk. So we move on now to the land cards, and we begin with Aether Hub. I'm sorry, Either Hub, excuse me. Uh, Either Hub is an uncommon land that when it enters the battlefield, you get an energy counter. You may tap to add a colorless mana to your mana pool, and that is a pure colorless mana. Uh, or you may tap and pay an energy to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. First of all, rest in peace, Tendo Ice Bridge. Tendo Ice Bridge came into play with a counter. You may tap it to remove that counter and add a mana to your mana pool, and from then on, just made generic colorless mana. 
that's it. That was a rare. That card actually started getting really expensive because it was one of the only cards that did that. This card does that and then some. It gets even better. It's able to use any energy for the rest of the game to make any color of mana. It's basically playable you know, up one side, down the other, because it's giving you energy for all your cool energy stuff. It's fixing your mana if that's what you need it to be in terms of your deck. So I love it in sealed. I love it in draft. And I 100% expect to see it in constructed. It's just too far pushed in terms of its ability and the way it works to not, honestly. I just I just don't see it. For one energy, you get one mana of any color. For the rest of the game, it gives the energy to something else if you don't need that other color. Like, that is good, efficient, fantastic magic card design. Uh, and I love how... Again, Wizards is able to take energy counters and do interesting, really cool, really sweet things with them. And yeah, sure, it, it you know, at some point, Tendo Ice Bridge was going to be passed. And today is that day. Blooming Marsh is next. And I'm going to cover the whole spectrum of what they call the Fast Lands that originally showed up in Scars. So, uh, so these are the enemy color Fast Lands. Now, Fast Lands, if you're not aware, they enter the battlefield tapped unless you control two or fewer other lands. So, you have, as long as you have two mana or less in lands on the battlefield, it's going to come into play untapped. So, it is basically a free dual land for the beginning of the game. That is very, very good. That is constructed worthy power. And as a result, there's I feel these are going to be literally just as good. They're going to see modern play. They're going to see standard play, uh, just like all the other Scars Fastlands did. Uh, and they are clearly playable as long as you're playing either, either of these colors and you're splashing for the third, uh, or obviously if you're in these two colors primarily. So all of the Fastlands are very, very good. Uh, I like them a lot. And it's interesting to me that they're even here because... It feels like the reason that these types of lands exist in sets is because those sets may need some help. And I'm not saying that's the case here, because I think clearly Kaladesh looks amazing. Uh, but that, you know, these are the types of cards that they're able to put in sets that may not be that great to kind of bolster them. You know what I mean? Like, you know, these great these lands are so great, they're going to sell the sets by themselves. So if you have a small set that you don't really, you're not really super confident in, you can put something like this in there to kind of bolster it. So no matter what's going on in that set, these lands are sweet, these lands are good, these lands will sell packs. I don't know. I don't think that's the case here. I think they were, they were clearly working on making sure that enough mana fixing is in the format. Uh, it's nice to complete the cycle. They are powerful and they are exciting. So it's one more reason for Kaladesh to be awesome. Uh, so so in that regard, you know that's 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 certainly interesting. But regardless, these are incredibly playable, uh, very powerful, will be fantastic and, and constructed, and your seal deck and your draft decks for as long as you need them. Inventor's Fair is next. It is a rare legendary land. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you control three or more artifacts, you gain one life. You may tap to add a, a colorless mana to your mana pool. You may pay four generic mana, tap, and sacrifice it. Search your library for an artifact card, reveal it, put it in your hand, then shuffle your library. You may activate this ability only if you control three or more artifacts. So there are twice over this thing referencing essentially Metalcraft without being Metalcraft. But here we are. Lands that do things, particularly lands that find things, are generally always very powerful. Cards that give you incremental advantages over the game are often very powerful because in this case you can just run one of it and still get benefit out of it. So if you're playing it as a one of in let's say you know modern affinity, if you're playing it as a one of in let's say modern lantern control, if you're playing it as a one of in say your standard deck that you have a lot of artifacts in, it's often kind of harmless but sometimes it's amazing. Sometimes it's gaining you life and sometimes you go and find the best artifact slash gear hulk in your deck and you smash your opponent with it. So it is 100% playable and limited. I don't even care if you're not 100% sure if you're ever actually going to trigger it. It is still worth it just for that opportunity alone. If you have any artifact worth getting, you really need to think about it because you know you need to have that card in your mind when you're playing your drafts or when you're playing your sealed to know that Inventor's Fair can go and get your best artifact as long as you have three or more artifacts in play. So, so we'll see how good this card is. There's not a lot of legendary lands in Magic. They've made less and less over the years, but this one is certainly, I think, good enough. Interesting, pushed. I love that it's the first story card. I love that it was the first card we saw of Kaladesh. I think it makes it, I think it just sort of perfectly encapsulates the coolness of the fair itself, and people are here. I'm going to show off some things. Uh, it has a really sweet, potentially very powerful ability, uh, and that's what we like in our Magic cards. So play the crap out of this thing and enjoy it. Next up is Sequestered Stash, which, if I am correctly counting, is our final card in Kaladesh. 
Sequestered cash, I'm sorry, sequestered stash huh, is an uncommon land that taps to add a colorless mana to your mana pool. You may pay four generic mana, tap, and sacrifice it to put the top five cards of your library into your graveyard. You may then put an artifact card from your graveyard on top of your library. Not your hand, on top of your library. This is pretty slow. This sets up your draw. Your opponent's going to know what you're, what you're going to be drawing next. However, you can do it at instant speed, which is important, which is good. Uh, if you have a bomb rare that is an artifact, this gets a lot more playable. If you just have good artifact creatures, I think it's kind of a toss-up, but I still think it's more than likely worth playing because, yes, you're going to mill yourself for five, even in limited. Don't worry about decking yourself if, unless they're running some sort of mill cards themselves. Uh, but really just you know, focus on what the best artifact card in your graveyard happens to be. Uh, I would never play it in a scenario where you're relying on turning over your best artifact card when you pay when you activate the ability. You're like, if I don't show this Gear Hulk, you know, whatever, I'm screwed. But remember, whatever the best artifact in Graveyard is, it's going on top of your library. So you want to do that at the end of their turn, so they don't have an entire turn to prepare themselves for it. Um, otherwise. You know, I think it's good in that there's very there's a very low cost to play this card. Like, at worst, it's tapping for a colorless mana. Okay, great. This is an artifact block. You're probably going to have some really sweet artifacts. Late in the game, it's probably going to pay off for you. And as a result, I love this thing in Sealed. I don't really love it in Draft because oftentimes you need your early mana and you need your mana on color whenever you need it, so on and so forth. But in Sealed, I think it's great and I think it's sweet to have as a casual option, as a land that gets back an artifact, even if it just goes to the top of your deck. So... Ladies and gentlemen, whew, we have spoken about every single card in Kaladesh. And let me tell you, I've been doing this a while, whether it's with Brad, whether it's with Jerry Thompson, whether it was Todd Anderson, whatever. I've been doing a lot of set reviews, so I go through a lot of magic sets. And I can tell you, there's been multiple times when I'm done with a set review and I go, man, that card, or that set rather, wasn't that good. And this is not that time. This is one of the sweetest sets I've seen in a while. Energy counters are amazing. Vehicles are unbelievably exciting. Just, just freaking hats off, Wizard, because you did an amazing job on this one. Kaladesh is easily one of the best sets in a very long time. We finally get to come back and have fun with magic. Not everything is death and disease and terror and things just destroying worlds and sucking up galaxies or whatever. So, Gal so Kaladesh is fun. Have fun with it. This set is great. This set review was fun. Thank you guys very much for being with me as a part of this journey from one to 200 and... 64 cards we didn't speak about 264 cards i get it but you know you know and i know that you know we spoke about every single card in kaladesh you guys are amazing thank you very much i hope you guys stay tuned my top 100 magic cards is continuing to roll on as we finish out that series i now have a green screen which is awesome the set reviews are back you guys are wonderful i love you much until next time magic players this is evan Irwin tapping the cards so you don't have to